Hello, and welcome to the third episode of Born to Create, an art podcast where each week I bring on a different creative from my course to chat about art. I hope our conversations will illustrate the current climate that we are living in and how the pandemic has impacted their art practice. I aim to show the value of art and creativity and dive into the stories of the artists that are soon to leave the fine art studios after three years at the University of Salford. Each episode surrounds the special guest. Today I've got Ree Hibbert with me to share their story. Hi. <laughs> it's really great to be here. I'm glad, I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Ree is a painter who's recently focused on oil paint as a medium to explore their own identity as a fat, queer, non-binary person possessing a traditionally female body. Their practice focuses primarily on colourful and expressive nude self-portraiture, and they use their body as a vehicle for representation in their work to explore and embrace the marginalisation that they experience day to day for simply existing in the world. Ree and I first bonded in life drawing class in our first year and have grown closer as we progressed through uni. We understand and support each other when life has gotten a bit hectic, and there's never a dull moment when we're together. Their work has opened my eyes to another subjective experience of the world, and I'm very grateful to have had my preconceptions of the female body challenged by the conversations that their work invites. I'm in awe of their dedication to paint as a medium, as well as the skill they have developed for painting over the years. Like me, they've come a hell of a long way and I will never stop encouraging them to be as amazing as possible. They're one of the people I can see myself being friends with forever, and I'm very grateful to have found such a good friend for life. Me too. (laughs) I'm honoured to have Rhi on my podcast, and I'm very excited to learn more about their journey through life with art as an anchor that kept them going through it all. So without further ado, Rhi, tell me a bit about where you're from and how that affects your work. Well... (laughs) Um, I'm from and I grew up in Manchester and I'm quite proud of it (laughs) especially in my teenage years I traveled quite frequently into like the city center and I made lots of friends just being surrounded by like creative people and we bonded primarily over music which has a very large influence on me Um, interesting yeah I feel like I need music all the time to like work or do anything like I don't understand people that don't listen to music because it's very constant for me and I bond really well with people over music like even in the studios like you're with me and I'm always listening to music or singing or doing something really random whilst listening to music and it like kind of powers me most of the time so I've made lots of friends surrounding music like aged 14 up um yeah and I think Manchester is a good place for that to happen because there's like this quote that always sticks with me from this guy called Tony Wilson and he's the head of um, Factory Records. He describes Manchester as a city that thinks a table is for dancing on (laughs) and it's not, yeah, it's not directly linked with art but it's linked with music and like I think that carries through to all of Manchester and all the things that I love about Manchester that impact me and have influenced me (laughs) it's quite culturally rich and there's just a lot of different people i I used to hang out with like moshers and like emos (laughs) it was great to just like go out every weekend because i used to just sit and talk and like be with people and there's just so many different people about and from different places and like when you go to Athlex, you go for it there's all different kinds of people and places and things and there's always something for someone And you always just get influenced by something or that you see and like even when you walk around there's like buildings with murals and all sorts there's (laughs) definitely a lot of graffiti that's beautiful yeah street art covering like even getting the bus into manchester like you know when you're coming to like the city center because Mm. like all the colors that are everywhere Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you're just like wow like i'm getting to like a good place to be so i just walk around with like friends and like it just is a big impact on me and it's like what makes me proud to come from Manchester so I used to go and like look at things every weekend that's awesome you know yeah it's, it's funny how you say that music isn't technically art but I feel like music is its own form of art like yeah maybe visual maybe visual fine art what we do kind of decorates space yeah but music decorates time that is so, very true <laughs> so you know 
You can't touch it, but it's there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I definitely consider. I, I also listen to music all the time. Yeah. I'm <laughs> always listening to music. It's my soundtrack to life. I'm mm-hmm. always in my own little music video, you know, prancing around. Main but character. Def- <laughs> main character vibes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, it's, I totally, totally relate to the, the music being a massive part of your life. Did you grow up in sort of a, a central, vibrant part of the city, or were you more external and coming in and out of it? Do you feel like that affected your work? I'm from like Greater Manchester, so like to get into the centre, even on the bus, it's like an hour at least, and that's on a good day. But I used to travel in so frequently, I think, from like ages about 12, 13 to about 19, every weekend I'd be out. And for hours and like both days of the weekend, so like I just was living partly in Manchester, like as a residency. Fair play. (laughs) Yeah, so. I liked going though and being around people and just sitting and listening to music and being around creative people because everyone I was surrounded with was either like musicians, painters and artists and all sorts. I'll be sit and like do weird creative things while we were sat there. Like what? What kind <laughs> um, of creative projects like, did you do? We'd always like someone would have a guitar, someone knitted and they like would bring like something they'd knitted for someone. That's <laughs> awesome. I know, even though it was like quite young and it people would be like, haha, grandma. <laughs> But someone would be like, I've knitted you this leaf. <laughs> It'd be very fun. <laughs> and then everyone's got really colourful hair as well, so I've always been surrounded mm. by colour, and I always dyed my hair, so I was colourful yes. as well. That is definitely <clears throat> something that I noticed about Ree when I first met them. <laughs> I was, oh, they would dye their hair every single colour of the rainbow. <laughs> Split dyeing, neons, oh, all of the colours. I was always so jealous. New colour every week. <laughs> literally. I had my hair dyeing phase, but I've gone back to sort of a natural shade these days. But I, 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 still I, got live, my I live vicariously through you. <laughs> but, <yeah>. Excuse me. <laughs> I guess that leads me on to my next question. Like, what was your journey into art school and why do you make art? Um, well, I studied art in high school at GCSE. I've always been like creative. I used to draw a lot, like just like Disney characters when I was younger. And then, so I chose it as a subject at GCSE. And then I chose it for A-levels as well. And I also did a year of photography, but <laughs> I don't speak about that. <laughs> <laughs> But as like a journey to art school, I think it really started when I was doing my foundation year because I did my A-levels and I didn't do that well because I just was in a hard place personally and just overwhelmed. But the idea of like going into a job straight out of that was really daunting. I was like, I don't want to just go work until I die, (laughs) which I know is like dramatic but that's what you're set up for in like school and it's Mm -hmm. really frustrating. Yeah, totally. So I still went to learn and like study. So I did three days a week on this foundation course at Tameside College, which was just like the local college that was actually the sister college to my college. And then I just worked night shifts over the weekend and my foundation was like really healing for me as a person. I was very overwhelmed. So even though I was studying and it was something I was like working at, it didn't feel stressful or charged with pressure. I just felt a lot of pressure. I feel like education works really fast and you don't get time to think and consider yourself. It's a very fast paced environment, but my foundation, yeah, they essentially stuck us in a room and was like, do what you need to do, (laughs) which worked. I love that, I Mm -hmm. love that. Just give you a space and let you go for it. So that's when I started to like have like a a passion to create things. which was really nice. Um, What kind of stuff were you making in foundation? (laughs) Um, I explored more materials. I used to draw a lot, so it was mostly just messing with stuff because in high school, there was like an emphasis on drawing just from teachers and stuff and very rigid. So like foundation was like, do whatever. So I did. (laughs) I just experimented with lots of different things. It was very different to what I do now. But I left the foundation with a distinction and then I got an unconditional offer for Salford and I remember getting the notification and I cried a bit because I was like, I'm from an area where like people don't really go to uni and like my parents didn't go to uni. I was like the first, one of the first in my family because my cousin went but it was like the first in my family unit. Like immediate family, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like expected of me. It just was like, you'll, oh, you'll get a job after college. And then I got to uni, which was always fun. Being from a background where you're not really told to go pursue uni and then achieving it 
was like a moment where I started to have like a like a little belief in myself more than and now I'm obviously at uni and I'm in an environment that's really comfortable and around people that do different things and discuss different things with their work and it's been like a great experience and it proper pushes me in my art journey. So yeah, okay. For my next question, <laughs> what inspired you growing up and where do you find your inspiration in the world? Well, like I said, like music fuels me a lot. So I got inspired a lot by music growing up and just being around colourful people. And I mean like colourful personalities and also physically colourful. <laughs> <laughs> like the colourful hair, all the things. Music just makes me function and my like some of my earliest memories are like Sunday mornings and my mum's just like blasting music cleaning and waking me up doing so. <laughs> so I'd like be a bit begrudged about it but then I'd also just go downstairs and also be listening to music <laughs> and then sometimes it was me doing the opposite. Other memories is being at my grandma's house and like it's summer and the music's on loud and like me and my cousins are doing like just activities and watching things and like having like a barbecue <laughs> and just it's something to look back on as I I don't know my life's just a bit centered with music which that's awesome yeah you know. <laughs> music is hugely powerful so it's no surprise at all no like it deeply affects our feelings and it helps us understand our own feelings it helps like us little, feel them little soul conversations exactly yeah exactly when I got into my teenage years I watched like a lot of anime and different shows so like more imagery that was artistic and my music taste got even more broad so like now I listen to like Korean music, um, French music, Chinese music, any kind of music and I just consume it. It's also when I got introduced into like gay culture, I kind of grew up in a household where it's fine for other people to be gay. I just would prefer it if you're not and it's not like... Same. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. It's not like an active problem. It's just like, uh, okay. Always present. Yeah, it's present and it's not something you can talk about because I grew up in like a heteronormative family. So like mum, dad, brother, and then like didn't really know any gay people or like they'd be like a random person at work that was gay and they're known as gay person, mm -hmm. gay their name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of those things. So I got like introduced with it and it was kind of like, I got submerged in it quite quickly and like through shows like RuPaul's Drag Race as an example and then being in Manchester there's like a lot of things to do with pride and like parades and like I was hanging around a lot of gay people <laughs> and different identities and like it was nice to be around these people and like feel in place kind of thing now though just people around me to be honest <laughs> um I'm on Instagram all the time looking at people and TikTok unfortunately <laughs> I think I receive I love about, hate Ruth. I think you I receive should. about three TikToks from Re a day. That's I'm not me complaining. It in. I am absolutely not complaining. They're always top quality <clears throat> TikToks. I shit post on Facebook and you just send me all of the TikToks. I do. I love it. I love it. I try and rein it in because I could <laughs> on, on a on oh, a bad day. Please don't. Like send them all to me. It's wonderful. <laughs> but yeah, I'm on Instagram all the time and TikTok. But at the moment, like one of the people that I look at a lot is um, a guy who's in Minnesota called Leo Knox, and they make fetish art. But their work does discuss like gender. That he's trans, so like seeing different gender standards for other people or how they are perceived is quite interesting, especially because my work isn't sexual. Like it's just quite a face value thing. So the juxtaposition between his work being sexual as a rule and then mine is quite interesting to look at and he's just very cool <laughs> it's nice to look at i get inspired by fellow students just all the people <laughs> let me see leo underscore knoxville l-e-o underscore k-n-o-x-v-i-l-l-e perfect yeah he's very cool i check him out sounds awesome mm-hmm so how has your style changed over time? Um, well, I used to draw a lot. I was very insistent that I'd only be someone who'd draw, which is funny now. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I was very rigid in drawing as well. I just was like very focused on yeah, drawing. Single-minded or something. Yeah. So I didn't really do anything else. I used to draw a lot of portraits and like eyes and I was very focused on portraits and just drawing people and didn't want to 
even look at myself I think I had the idea to just look away from me and just look at other things because I was being influenced by things and not realizing what that meant to me mm. <laughs> but then in my final major major project for, for like my foundation course I'd been exploring like materials over the year but I started painting for that project and <laughs> I cut these massive sheets of fabric and I just dyed them with like paint and ink and it was the biggest mess and <laughs> it was everywhere. I love that. Yeah, and then I brought it home and dried it over my mum's washing line and she was Oof. like, I need that. And I was like, it's mine. Too bad. Mm -hmm. And then I filled these bottles with like paint and just squirted it everywhere. It was everywhere, everywhere. The floor was dyed for about three years, <laughs> like outside, because I did it outside because it was huge, it was meters long that's awesome yeah and then i took it back to college which was a journey on the bus <laughs> and then i painted on it these big orange blobs of orange peel like looking things i was focused on looking at fruit as a metaphor for death i was sorry was that fruit as a <coughs> metaphor for death yeah and like just processes okay. um when i was in high school my friend killed herself and it impacted me a lot so i think it was healing to process death as a process and not just something that had happened in my life, which was... That's powerful. Yeah. Art therapy. Yeah. Super, super valid and relevant. Yeah. Did you, so you said that you started with drawing, but I guess now that your preferred medium is has slightly changed. Entirely painting. I kind of fell in love with painting at that point. In my first year, I think that, cause in the first year, I came in and I was like, I need to experiment. And then I was like, but painting. <laughs> I was like, I've already done this. Mm. Need to paint. I think it helped though farming it, farming my practice as a painter and it became stronger towards the end of the first year. Yeah, and I was focused on acrylic and now I do oil as my preferred medium. <laughs> we have a question from one of our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, shout out Gina, who has asked you if you ever feel like painting is a chore. Yes and no. <laughs> I think that it can come across as a chore if you're in a bad mood about it. Because my thing is sometimes when I hate stuff, I still have to paint it out because I'm not gonna, I need to process it and go through it, the motions. As an overall thing, like I'm completely in love with painting. And like, I appreciate it as a process now because oil is a process, not just a medium to me. It can feel like a chore, but I appreciate it as a chore. Like when you make your bed in the morning, you always appreciate it when you come back and it's already made and you're like, oh, I can just get in my bed. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. I think maybe I'll move on to the next question then Ooh. for now. What is your current work about? <clears throat> what does it aim to do or what show, you know? Do? My work is about identity in one word. Um, I'm a fat queer person and I just explore this through nude self portraiture. When I first started to focus on this, I kind of ignored it. <laughs> I think I was more focused on art, like paint as a medium and I was enjoying like the process and I just would get lost in it. So I didn't really have that much of an aim. Like I kept saying that I'll paint until I love myself and I've kind of dropped it at some point. It's still in there. It's just not a focus. <laughs> Fair play. But my work is self-expression and looking into myself and also at other people around me but like through me um as an aim it's self-expression so i just think it's good to facilitate conversations that i didn't get to have growing up about how heteronormative society impacts you and like gender roles and just what you're supposed mm. to be engineered from a school like a little factory um so my aim is just to facilitate a conversation and then I think that you need to do a lot of self-reflection sometimes, well, in my practice anyway. So like lockdown was quite significant for me because I was on my own, I was isolated. I just had a lot of time with myself and like, it wasn't always positive. <laughs> Mood. So like mentally, I was a little shriveled. <clears throat> Understandable. Yeah, but I went into it and then I had to like embrace myself because I was the only one with myself, so. It just was a lot of exploration. I think that lockdown facilitated the kind of privacy that I needed as well, because I'm quite a shy, introverted person. 
I might not appear it sometimes, but like I am at my core and it's hard to discuss things that feel so private and even when you've not had the conversation with yourself first. Mm. So it started off as self-acceptance through lockdown. Lockdown really helped me, even if I kind of hated it <laughs> at the time. And then when we did a project in the second year to do with professional context um, and like we had to discuss what the government thought about art. It led to me thinking and reflecting on how coming from a working class background and coming into university where I don't speak the language that is written in and realizing I don't have the vocabulary <laughs> and like how what that means for me and like discussing not just me as a, my identity as like a person but as an artist. Mm. So I was aiming to work out different ideas of self really interesting mm -hmm. i'm fascinated by life hacks do you have any tips or tricks for different techniques or materials that you've discovered with your time at uni that you think would be helpful for our listeners i think not a tip to do with a medium but like a tip in general is just to try anything once because i do things reluctantly all the time and then they become a strength, which is very irritating because I ignore them all the time. Um, and I think that you just kind of have to push through doubt because like anything that you encounter, you just need to look for a solution, not a failure, because there's, it's not a failure. Things aren't cut and dry. Happy little accidents, yeah. as Bob Ross Bob would put Ross. it. <laughs> Wise <repeat>. words. <laughs> yeah, rest in peace, dude. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, moving more towards that, like getting back to the art you're making these days, and mm -hmm. can you isolate your current practice to sort of a, a single theme or concept? This is going to sound self-obsessive, <laughs> but the theme is just me. Love it. Um, growing up, I was like from a nuclear family, and just my reality was heteronormativity and not being the ideal kind of body type. I was always the fat kid out of the loop and I was bullied quite a bit. It was hard to make friends. <laughs> At one point I was put into a friendship group which made me even less likeable, which I got to make a pom-pom though. That was good. Score. Creativity Art saves, saves the, the day. day. <laughs> but now in my practice, like I'm able to explore what queerness is for me and like exploring what being a fat person is because my body was always underrepresented and the representations that were available just weren't flattering at all. There's like always, what diet should this person be on? Told to lose weight when I was a child <laughs> by just people, really. Mm, people um, thinking they understand your health based on your size, like they have absolutely no idea. Yeah, based on BMI, which is yeah. outdated mm. and racist. <laughs> um. <laughs> Love that for society. Mm -hmm. But I just never really looked at myself or appreciated myself at all. I didn't recognise that I existed outside of other people's ideas and perceptions of me. And there's, I can't remember who it's by, but there's a quote and it's like, the most important part of an image is the seven inches behind the camera. Or it might be like somewhat similar. So it's like saying that the person who creates the image is the most important piece which applies now. I heard it the first time, I was like, yeah, that's true. Like, you're the eye behind it. You're the creator. And mm. what you want to put out is the thing that matters. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that's mm. quite reflective and yeah. useful. I'm really, I'm just, that's made me think of things I like it is. <laughs> Sent you into a realm of thought. <laughs> it's, yeah. triggered a, it's triggered my brain thoughts to start <laughs> whizzing. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating. I'd never heard that quote before. Like your intention and like what you put into it, because even though when it goes out, an audience will consume it and then you're like, their perception will matter, but you're always going to have a certain thing behind it and it wouldn't exist without you. Like without the purpose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's super interesting. Yeah. Like, are there any other themes that are important to your work? Um, In my second year, I explored mental health and like isolation just because it came hand in hand with being in lockdown and quite isolated and like 
suddenly pulled away from this community we developed in the studios and it just it just became like a, a thing because I had to discuss it because it's what was going on but recently I've been exploring gender identity and like its impact on how I view myself and what being female bodied means to me and the stereotypes that can come with it. It's, it's interesting it sounds like and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like your art practice is kind of an extension of what you're feeling at the moment. Yeah, no, exactly. It's a reflection of me, which is funny because I looked at mirrors quite a lot last year. And I think that's when it started. <laughs> Buys a mirror, starts reflecting. Oh dear. <laughs> Stares at myself <laughs> for hours on end. I Who did do are that. are you? <laughs> Why did I do exactly the same thing? Yeah, move, moving on to my... Next question, mm -hmm. what kind of artists influence you and who, who's your biggest influence? My work is largely influenced by painters and it always has been. In high school, I used to sit and sketch out Van Gogh paintings <laughs> and like the marks. Nice. I was very like consumed by them. And it still carries through today because just before lockdown, like just before lockdown, I went to um, meet Vincent Van Gogh um, the immersive experience and it's still my favourite exhibition I've ever been to and there's like all these activities and I got to sit and draw and it was amazing yes yeah it was great to like revisit the interest that I'd always had in him and I know it's like a common he's a common painter everyone knows who he is there's like a different connection there and it was nice because he obviously explores like themes of mental health and like just seeing the marks he makes and all sorts, it just was really interesting to like compare it to him as a person, not just as a painter, because we just kind of idolise paintings sometimes. And then other painters that I am also inspired by, Jenny Savile, obviously. Nice, yeah. Um, the body, just her experience as a woman, because I am female, like biologically, and growing up female, I was socialised as that, so relatable to our experience um, mm. and then two recent influences are Celia Hampton who did a series of painted nudes she'd go on like chat rooms of people masturbating and paint them it was quite interesting so they would be masturbating not her yeah okay. and she'd just paint them and sometimes they'd masturbate to her and sometimes not <laughs> but she used to paint them and like she'd ask permission but the quick paintings and they're like oil and they're just very interesting to look at but she's done other series where they're long studies and the colours are really beautiful I really love the colours and then someone else I was looking at was Salman Tor and he's um, from Pakistan and he moved to America but he's like he's a queer person so he's like discussing a story between queerness and like his experiences as an immigrant and his paintings are beautiful like his color stories are amazing and his painting and like his figures are like it all <laughs> apparently i looked at tracy emin in like my first and second year at salford and i think she had an impact on me because she's quite open and blunt about herself mm. and when i'm starting to facilitate a conversation about myself she was good to look towards because she's just so cut and dry yeah, she lays it out for the audience she's like yeah come look at me yeah. Come do it. She's very unapologetic, isn't she? She kind of got me over my shyness a bit, I think. That's it's awesome. It's really hard being introverted and then trying to discuss something so private, so... <laughs> I guess this kind of relates to another question from one of our listeners, mm -hmm. whose name is Chris, and he has asked whether there are any direct inspirations for their use of colour. Well, at the moment, Celia Hampton and also Maria Lasnik, which is actually my biggest artist influence, they both use colour in such beautiful ways and I'm actually in love with colour which people know because I just talk about it all the time. Your colours are beautiful. I really understand colour mm. and it's like a, a skill at this point. Mm, <laughs> not def as a, not Definitely. Like... <laughs> You've studied it hard and mm. you really put effort into learning the colour theory that uh, you describe warm tones and cold tones and white mixed paint and dark mixed paint and I'm sat there in awe going, <laughs> yes, your knowledge is amazing, <laughs> tell me more. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but you manage to get colours that just don't muddy. Somehow you manage to have all of the colours present in your paintings. And I love that because mm. your marks are really clear and defined and confidently placed on the paper. So I can really see how your passion for colour comes through. Comes through. 
it's it's very hard to balance and it's like a skill I've learned like I feel, sound like I'm bragging when I say that I understand it but I just I've learned it it's something that I work hard at learning yeah, I don't think you're bragging I just think you've put hard working and now you're you've got the got skills it. that you've worked hard for <laughs> girl boss <laughs> girl what girl boss girl boss damn, damn straight bad bitch <laughs> Last year, a tutor looked at this weird, bad painting that I did in probably 10 minutes, and it's like one of the most awful things I've ever done. And he was like, Maria Lasnik. <laughs> and I was like, I looked at her work and I was very confused. But as I've like continued painting, I see it now, but I didn't see it at the time because to me that painting was like a sketch with a paintbrush rather than a painting. Because now like painting's a process to me, not just a way to make things. <laughs> If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I'm really grateful for like him saying that. It was really nice because it's positively impacted me. And like I still go back and revisit her work quite often. Her work surrounds inhabiting a body. So like her, her portraits are quite bizarre to look at. So like she won't paint her hair because she can't feel it. And it's like her experience of the world through her body and like touch. Um, yeah. <laughs> So she like dubbed it body housing and like she's passed away now, but she was active for like many years. So I can only hope to be the same. Anyway, I just really admire her color and form and her influence has definitely shaped my practice to where it is currently. And it just allowed me to have like a different appreciation for color and form. And I think it kickstarted me learning, actively learning color theory which you hear about it when you're like studying at GCSE and you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Mood. <laughs> but I'm in love with colour now because of her work. And That's awesome. Yeah. My favourite piece from her is You Are Me, which she's... <laughs> Just look at it, it's beautiful. <laughs> but it was like the first piece I saw of hers, or like one of the first, and like it's still my favourite no matter how many pieces of her work I see. So. Could you briefly describe it for our um, She's nude. Um, she's an old lady at this point. It's one of her last paintings before she went into like hospice care, I think. I think it's in two from 2003 and she died not long after it. It's titled You Are Me and she's got a gun pressed to her head and then also outwardly at the canvas and it's really a, weird to look at and it's staring you out. I've not seen it in person but it's huge so like it's very confrontational and kind of like leans over you and I've found it really cool. Well, I'd love to see it in person. Like. That's a How goal. big are we talking? A foot over your head, or something, or so maybe like a bit more, foot. maybe a bit taller. Yeah, it's, it sounds really cool. And what are the colours like on it? It's flesh based, but there's like poles of different colour in it. Her features are wrinkled, like her body's not desirable, and she doesn't paint a background. Like she leaves it white or blank, and then the figure just like occupies this blank canvas, but it's. A choice that she made so it's not like an afterthought like it's thought about it's like her mouth <laughs> i remember describing it once as if it was like a gash in her face because of how vibrant the inside of the mouth is mm -hmm. compared to like the face and her eyes are very blue she's very good at blues i think and like bright colors beautiful <laughs> awesome right this next question is my favorite question of mm -hmm. all my questions because i think <clears throat> that uh, most people don't necessarily think about how creative days look like. Oh, you asked me, you wrote this question down and I was like, what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had to think. Yeah, you had to think about what you do day to day because I think all of our experiences differ so much that I'd love to know what a creative day in your life looks, looks like. like. Yeah. And maybe you can describe a couple of projects or anything you've worked on that you're the most proud of mm. and how you went about doing that because I think it will be interesting to see the contrast between all the artists that I interviewed. Mm -hmm. A creative day in my life is more like a creative rolling week because I'm not productive every day but it just because I work in ebbs and flows and sometimes I push myself because I firmly believe sometimes I just have to paint out things that I'm not gonna like because that's just how things work it's subjective anyway so someone will like it if I don't to be Very quite true. honest <laughs> so like I'll have days where I feel like I'm doing nothing but it's just because I'm not making something physical and I'll also be helping other people so like photo shoots are just talking to people which is 
a lot more work than people think it is because <laughs> you're just formulating ideas mm. um i used to be a lot more creative at night like i used to have like days where i just not sleep and do work and like probably work about 12 hours in a go which didn't benefit me as a person as an artist though brilliant positives and negatives mm -hmm. but like recently i found it quite nice to work in the day because we're allowed back in the studios now properly and i really love being surrounded by people and like i'll put some music on and just do what i need to do and probably be around too much white spirit which you know that's good makes the day fun it does <laughs> me a bit loopy mm. always a bit fun it's good to be in like this positive environment again because lockdown was so isolated and like negative and being so pulled away from like people who I was just about making friendships with and appreciating other people so like not being the only person involved in this conversation that is my work is lovely mm -hmm. to put it as like a word mm. on an ideal day I'll come into the studio about 9 or 10 maybe a bit later depending how late I'm gonna stay but then sometimes I don't predict that i'm gonna stay late it just happens but i so, yeah no it's not you it's usually me i don't want to leave there's people there and i've not seen people for two years <laughs> there's people that arrive at 3 p.m and stay till late Hi. always nice <laughs> <laughs> to be fair though i'm not really productive on my own i feel like now mm. i'm back in the studios i need people to be with me so i can just do things because i just get very distracted by anything and everything and I just, sometimes I just sit there for like an hour and do nothing. Just let my brain drain onto the table, as you do. <laughs> I usually like chip away at things until like I fall into a pattern of doing some painting and like just speaking to people. And then I'll like, when I know that I'm being productive, I set myself like a goal of you can't leave until you do this much. So I'll be like two paintings today, three paintings today. And I think like the most I've done in a day was like seven. When you say you do seven paintings, do you work on them simultaneously or is it like one painting start to finish one after the other? Usually like start to finish one after the other, but I've been thinking recently that maybe I could try and do a few on the go, but I don't want to distract myself too much. But I think it's going to be worth a try because I realise that I lose form as I go into things if I'm doing quite a few in a row. So I think it's because I'm lazy and I don't want to clean things. So I just kind of fall into not doing things as I should or how I would prefer to do them. But sometimes it turns out nice. So pros and cons. Very much so. Yeah. So I usually stay late when I can and I keep falling into a habit of like meeting my mum. When she works like a late shift, I'll meet her and then I'll just be like, mum, take me home. <laughs> Please. Okay. I just get in a car and then... Sorted. It's good though, if I'm on a roll, I get to stay and like yeah. know that I'm going to get home and then I go to bed and then I get up again. I usually get up about... On the days where I come in for nine, I'm usually up about half six, which is a long day. I'm so tired all the time. Oof. But I don't do it all the time, so it's all right. I respect it, <clears> but my gosh, I could not do this. the grind. <laughs> mm, I definitely respect your grind. Random question. Mm -hmm. How many items of clothing have you ruined because of oil paint? All of my clothing. <laughs> <laughs> but like genuinely, mm. if you had to think about, I, I think I, I asked this question purely because yesterday in the studios, <laughs> Rhi was wearing a white top and lent into the painting to mark it not once, but twice. First with white paint and then another colour. I think I wasn't it was quite, brown. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but the brown was in the white because I was being really messy and I'd put too much white on the canvas and it just transferred everywhere. And then I got home and I had blue dots all over me. <laughs> and I just was like, oh. But also, I was wearing light, these light grey pants. You can't see them. You can now. Yeah. <laughs> and also this hoodie, which is not a good colour. But at the moment, it's I brave. like... It's brave. It is brave. It is brave. Say. And I shouldn't be brave because I've not got any clothes left. <laughs> I mean, you know, it kind of tells who you are. People meet you, you're like covered in paint. And it's, so like, it's very clear what, what you, you do. do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I don't decorate houses, but I'm covered in paint. All my clothes are decorators' clothes. I, I'm I say this, but I've literally got paint on my arm right now from yesterday. Yesterday, I got on the bus because I put oil paint on my nose and I got on the bus and I realised because I went to touch my face and I was oh, like, no. oh no. And I was like, this is very oily. It gets in my hair. My hair 
after like you know how you wash your hair and then you're like i'll leave it a week yeah, yeah. i i have to leave it like two days <laughs> it's stuck to my head and i could fry an egg on it within yeah, like two oh hours of being gosh. around oil paint oh gosh fun times <laughs> yeah. one time i went to my friend's house i was talking to him he's like do you want to go wash up i was like why I had blue marks down all of my arms. I was like, no, just leave it there. It's fine. <laughs> this is it just like, who it, I am now. It was acrylic, so it's okay oh, to yeah. transfer. Oh, throwback to when you covered me in acrylic paint. Oh, I oh. paint so th- oh. My paintings are very thick with Oof. paint. You Oof, were that covered. Was, that was a fun time. I think. Yeah, probably about a good two millimeters of paint covered my entire yeah, I was surface like scraping of my torso. It off you. Mm. Acrylic paint is, is plastic based. <laughs> so if you think about <clears> how the paint will apply to skin and then just dry and solidify. I basically had another skin shell of paint <laughs> all over my arms, face, neck, and torso, and back. And uh, I think we stood in the, uh, I, I couldn't clean my own back because obviously I can't reach it. And <laughs> Rhea and I had to stand in the, the bathrooms while they just scrubbed my back. And like threw globs of paint yeah, into the bin. Yeah, just peeled it off. It was disgusting. It was uh, an experience. experience. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was known as the naked girl in first year. Oh, that because you couldn't year. put your top on because I yeah, painted it because so I was thick. Covered in paint. It just would not dry. Yeah. It was terrible. <laughs> it was good, but it was terrible. Cool photos though, worth it. Was it was very cool, I enjoyed very, it. Very worth it, but oh my God. Mm-hmm. It's safe to say I won't be covering myself in acrylic paint anytime soon again. No. That was uh, probably not great for my skin. <laughs> that was like the point where you're like, mm, no more. <laughs> That's it, Please. we're done now. <laughs> yeah, enough of this. <laughs> Tried it once, that'll do. Do you have any proudest projects? Um, I don't. I, f- I help people, but I don't collaborate unfortunately i'm gonna collaborate soon i think i don't know with who i'm just gonna grab someone and be like please do it collaboration is a great way of expanding your practice Mm -hmm. and getting inspired i've literally over the last two days somehow i've managed to get two collaborations with two different people and i'm more inspired than ever it's wonderful yeah i love like just talking to people and hearing what they're on about i think at the moment like it's not my project it's Eleanor's project who I think is gonna be on this podcast at some point they did a photography project and I was feeling quite isolated at home for I was I think I'd had a sinus infection and I just was a bit poorly so I just shut myself out a bit and then I was like I'll just come help and it was really great to like help other people um because Elna also needed me, so I think it's good to even be behind the scenes and not the selling point of a project. And it was very quite impromptu, and I was glad I was there because it ended up that the other people who were helping things just didn't work out, and I was there, and it was nice to be saved needed. I saved the day. <laughs> no, but sometimes it like sometimes you do need that person to really sort of pull up all the slack because you can. It's unpredictable what can go wrong. Yeah. And no. it sounds like you were really helpful on that. I felt helpful. I'll yeah. ask Elna about Good. it. Yeah. We'll see. You'll get an update in a few episodes. <laughs> Elna's going to be like, mm. <laughs> No, I really enjoyed it. I'm actually going to help out next Wednesday on another one as well. So Ooh. that's fun. Ooh. Very exciting. Very exciting. I we love collabing. It. We do. So that brings me to my next question, mm-hmm. which is one of the areas in which I am the weakest. So I hope that you might have some... You good advice help. for you me. You can help. <laughs> but how do you seek out opportunities? Um, for opportunities to work with people, usually just like the studio and being around and just talking to people and be like, oh, I have an idea. Oh, I'll help you. And like, I know quite a few people at Salford from before I came to uni. So like, I can weigh in on things they do. And if I wanted to, I could ask people to help me with things. Like I have friends who study music and my friend Chris who asked us a question before is on graphic design so usually we share things like it's just I think sharing is a lot of it for like exhibition and more professional opportunities I do I'm like I've got an account with curator space I think you do as well actually probably probably yeah (laughs) it's just like people put out adverts for projects or exhibition opportunities or you can get workshops on there. There's all sorts. You can like tailor it to what you need or what you want. You like sign up, you say what you are, what you're interested in. And then even if you're not actively looking, you get like an email every week or every other week. And then 
you can just browse it and like open your email and you find stuff on there sometimes. I've not found anything in particular for me but I've like forwarded opportunities to other people and I find Instagram quite use useful at the moment as well for seeking out things like um, this month I'm going to be in an exhibition with Limp just celebrating queerness and I'm going to be showing two paintings which is an like, exciting opportunity. When's that exhibition on? Um, the 22nd of March I believe. Exciting. Yes. Um, I think I'll be going to that. I'm you are, like to I see think. It's going to be fun. Mm. Um, I'm very much looking forward to it. It's like the first place my work's been shown. So exciting opportunity. It's and also exciting. exciting to make connections with other people mm. and artists. Networking, and, for and sure. queer people, community. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I think it's quite important to remind our listeners and just sort of anyone that I can ever speak to ever in my life because I will never ever shut up about this topic mm -hmm. of the importance of art and artists to society and I'd love it if you could describe how you feel the role of the artist is important mm -hmm. to society and what art brings to our world. Our passion. <laughs> exactly. Um, well an artist to me is just the act of being human like my work is very centered on humanness and like my experience as a person art pulls from society and how we experience life and just things that go on like protest art we use it for communication it's universal you don't need to understand a language to look at something language can help but it's like when you listen to a song in a different language and you just enjoy it i think i think what you're saying is that there's different ways of enjoying and appreciating art so the colors the mm -hmm. patterns whatever you're seeing multiple forms yeah there you go that will bring you some form of appreciation then the language can give you a deeper understanding yeah exactly and it's not you can always yeah you can look at it at face value if you need to obviously like stuff that you need to know context to is also amazing but as a whole like you can just look at it and be like I get something from that. Mm, especially yeah. with music, it just you can't help how you feel no. to a song. It doesn't matter what the lyrics are, even yeah. sometimes just the beat carries you through life. Yeah. It? Yeah. See, that's how I see colours in paint really? and things. Yeah, <laughs> It's really weird, but at the moment, I've realised that if I look at a painting and think, mm, I could eat that, I really like it. <laughs> and I know that sounds really bizarre, but like I'm... I think that looks delicious. <laughs> I was writing the introduction for this podcast and I was like, I can't describe their work as delicious. You could That's do. not right. I can't do that. It makes but, me laugh though. Yeah, but the thing is, yeah, because with all of your paintings, yeah, they're like re repaints uh, close up, like snapshots. Zo zoomed in snapshots <clears throat> of their body and they're composed in a way where their flesh looks edible. Just delicious and just, <laughs> just scrumptious and there's not I don't have it better words tasty. for it and it's, it's, why, it's why I think one of your paintings from first semester looks like an apple yeah you call it apple yeah and I call then, it apple and then there's apple 2.0 which I've just nicknamed rotten because the colours make it look like a rotting apple which is a compliment I take it as because yeah. I like colour yeah, okay. you were painting a, <clears throat> another painting yesterday and you were using sort of darker reds and darker it looks quite purples. meaty yeah, it looks so meaty and I looked at it I was just like oh I just want to just want to smush it I want to I want to grab it and I want to mm. throw it in a pan and, uh, fry it up <laughs> yeah, yeah sure exactly. that's what I want to do to you oh my god Whoa. weird wow um but yeah it's just yeah I, I really that's so awesome that you would describe it as that the art you like is delicious because I would 100% call your art delicious mm -hmm. and the way you paint and the smoother and like it's even in like the texture of the paint because mm. you like to put paint quite thickly but you've got sort of like nice curved lines i get really into it mm. sometimes oh yeah totally get lost in the sauce mm. <laughs> i'm keeping that in you, you don't do. get to remember i'm not that. ashamed it's iconic. <laughs> i said it yesterday as well but i had the bottle of white spirit open and i thought it was that but it's not it's just me <laughs> <laughs> oh. but ah we were talking about yes, that. Yes, we were. Yeah, did um, you have more points to say? I did sociology at A-levels. Mm. One of the definitions for society was a set of norms and values that everyone like has mm -hmm. and like what they uphold to. So like politeness or like manners or etc. Mm -hmm. And like 
art is important to society because it brings about change and it's not as direct as like a petition or a, a bill or something in place by a government but like through people's thoughts because we govern one another through like speech and actions. It's not like a law but like you see art as protest all the time it does bring about change and because it is so universal it gives everyone like this opportunity to widen their perspectives and like also give insight to one another's life and their experiences which I really enjoy. I think especially over lockdown a lot of people realised this when they came to do crafts and sharing stuff and like it just builds connections so that is why art is important. <laughs> Damn straight. Connecting mm -hmm. people for sure. For mm -hmm. sure. Ah, so that brings us to the culmination of this podcast where I ask every single artist that I interview mm -hmm. to provide me with three quotes that I could hypothetically make an oracle card for them as mm -hmm. an artist based on a pack of oracle cards that I received. They're very cool, I like them. They are very cool. They're really inspirational. Yeah, and, and also make you think about yourself because mm. I was sat thinking, oh, I have to think about myself. Mm. As free sentences. Yeah, and it's interesting <laughs> trying to think about whether those mottos actually apply apply to your life and how you see your life and how you approach the world. Mm -hmm. So I would love it if you could provide me with your life, work and inspiration mm -hmm. quotes to round off this podcast. Mm -hmm. Well, for life, life isn't linear. The good and bad are just things to embrace. For work, the state of being human is art itself, and to lean into yourself is art. Mm. And then for inspiration? Put trust in colour and form. No. No. Mm -hmm. They're really interesting. They're really cool. I can really see those being you. So that brings us to the end of this podcast, and I would like to thank Reen Hibbert very kindly for being here. Would you like to give your Instagram handle so that people can follow you on the internet? Um, at rewrapped, but spelled as R H R I R H A T on Instagram, and that's where you find all of my art stuff at the moment. Shoot me a message if you want. I'm a very friendly person. I love people. Talk to me. Yeah, definitely. Don't <coughs> don't hesitate to reach out to either of us, and we always love to hear from people and mm -hmm. collaborate and get new ideas. Yeah, I thrive in communities of creative people and I'd love to broaden it. 100%. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank you for listening. I will talk to you in the next one. <laughs>